the reason we want to sit down with you and just ask a few key questions is because there's these disasters, these wildfires that are burning, and there are a lot of questions now. People are saying, oh, wait a minute, these are fast-moving fires. What do folks with access and functional needs need to pay attention to that may be different from other folks that are more mobile or have greater uh, you know, evacuation ability? So it, this may sound like a stupid question, but why is it different for folks that are facing a disaster evacuation and that type of thing for those that have access and functional needs? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Uh, and I appreciate you asking that. So individuals with access and functional needs do have considerations to, to take in mind and to plan for that able-bodied people don't. And some of those have to do with transportation. For example, if I'm gonna be evacuated, I can't get into any vehicle. I have to have a, a specialized vehicle that's got a ramp and it's accessible from my wheelchair. Uh, I might have mobility devices. I might have a, a pet uh, or a, a dog that provides services for me that has to evacuate with me. So the key here is planning, it's proper planning. Plan what would I do in an emergency situation and have that worked out before an emergency happens. So it's preparedness month. This is a perfect time to look at that. You've got fires burning, they're moving quickly, and if you don't know what you're gonna do, chances are you're gonna find yourself in a tough spot. So if I'm a relative or a friend that I know I have a friend like you or, or maybe an elderly grandparent that has a hard time getting around, is there anything I can do now to help with that? Like, what can I do? Absolutely. And again, it's, it's all going back to getting a plan in place and having a network. So if it's somebody that you need to check in with, check in at regular intervals. If you know you might have to evacuate, put in a plan. How will we evacuate this individual? How will I get out? If I can't rely on my own transportation, what about a neighbor? What about a friend? What about a family member? What about any of the groups that I'm involved with, church or otherwise? And you need to go about four deep. That's what we tell people. Go four deep because chances are, in, in the, the heat of it all, emergency situation, you're not gonna have access to everybody that you've planned for it. But if you go four deep, you should be able to get a hold of somebody. Give a couple examples of what are some of those challenges, like how much longer it takes, or the vehicles. Like that's a, it's interesting like, that you maybe not think of. Like I can't just drive over to your house and pick you up. That's exactly right. So you have to plan for what I call the good, the bad, and the ugly. The good is I've got my own vehicle. It's accessible. It's set up the way I need it to be. I can get in and out comfortably. I've got somebody that's going to be there with me that can get me out when I need to go. The bad is I'm relying on somebody that's maybe three or four deep on my plan. It's in a, a vehicle that isn't comfortable. I may have to leave my wheelchair behind. Right? This is an emergency type of situation. The ugly is I'm relying on somebody I don't know. This is law enforcement, first responders. They're gonna come, they're gonna grab me, and it's just about survival. Pulling me out, loading me up somewhere, and getting me out of the out of the danger area. But under all three scenarios, number one thing, life, protection of life. So now this, your office here at Calavis has done some videos that are available online. Describe what those are, how, how are those helpful? Yeah, so we've got videos and, and they're fully accessible uh, videos and, and what's great about them is we have, for example, earthquake videos that talk about preparation. And the principles that we use during one disaster are directly applicable in another disaster. They talk about things like, what can I as an individual with an access or functional need do? What can you, as somebody who knows, loves, cares about, or takes care of somebody with an access or functional need do? And what can we as a community do? And I would encourage everybody to go look at the videos, go to websites like ready.gov, and come up with a plan. Because by the time the emergency happens, it's too late to just try and cobble something together. And these are real practical videos. It's not just yeah. saying this is a problem and you should plan, but it actually has steps you can follow. Oh yeah, it's step-by-step. It's step. Listen, none of this is rocket science. And that's the great advantage that we have. We're not asking you to do something impossible. We're not even asking you to do something really hard. All we're saying is get a plan in place. How would you plan to go to a movie? 
I'd still need an accessible ride. I'd still need to have somebody pick me up. I'd need a schedule. And I would have to either call, text, email, contact somebody to execute that plan. This is the same thing. The only difference is it's a movie that'll save your life. Describe like when we're not in uh, disasters, which in California is kind of a hard to describe that time, yeah. but what does your office do in non-emergency times? One of the things during non-emergency times that we do, we provide training for individuals that do disaster planning, and we also go out to localities. And one of the things that we want to do is empower local governments to be truly inclusive and integrate individuals with access and functional needs into their planning process. So we're here to empower folks to make sure that anybody with an access and functional need is taken care of before, during, and after disaster. And that's, that's probably the benefit of it is that it's not you're just coming to check up on them, but it's you're bringing that expertise and those yeah, resources and, and that makes it easy for them to plan. That's right. And, and we're not there to tell them what they're doing wrong and we're not there to criticize. What we're there to do is support and empower. And we have resources, they're available, they can be leveraged, and, and they're right here for you to use. You just gotta call us and, and we'll even call you. Just gotta let us in the door. Um, this really is a, a community approach. And our partners are the greatest resource that we have. Our partners are anybody in nonprofit or private sector, government or otherwise, want and care for the needs of anybody with an access or functional need. So I tell folks that we got to do it together or it's not going to happen at all. I think we've, we've had a big wake-up call with these fires. We have to learn from this. Every time we learn. Anything I haven't asked you that you think is important to say? I, I, I think, again, let's just use what we're learning and what we're seeing on the news right now as a start reminder we have to prepare and we have to do it now. It can't wait. It's too important. Think of the individuals in your life that have an access to functional need and make sure a plan's in place to take care of them. And just to say, to some people think, well, if, if you have to be in a wheelchair to be access and functional need, it could be anybody that has something that limits their ability. So That's absolutely right. And it can be anything from an injury to being transportation disadvantaged and everything in between. So anything that's gonna limit your ability to get out in a safe, timely, easy fashion is considered an access or functional need. There's a lot of people that fall under that umbrella. Great, well thank you very much. This is very helpful, I appreciate it. Thank you.